This is a talk actually about what it means to be a big data developer. Um, and I need to warn you in advance that I'm maybe too sarcastic for this world. So uh, if you can take it, could be difficult. But anyway, uh, I hope that I can tell you a little bit about this. Um, these things that are necessary to become a big, uh, to be big data developer. First of all, a short disclaimer. I will not flame war, I will not rant, I will not bash any product or do any similar here. I will be sarcastic, but it's not that. And it's just more because I'm just, I'm for, uh, just too tired of it, you know, um, after a couple of years fighting. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoy this. So what I will do is a sort of, I'm not an actor, but I will try to, to do a sort of uh, um, stand-up comedy playing two persons. One person will ask stupid questions. The other person will try to answer these stupid questions. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't want to get judged by who, is, who this person is actually me. But anyway, <laughs> okay, let's start it. So this is the guy asking questions. <laughs> so he says just, hey dude, I'm a big data developer. Who in this room is actually a big data developer? Or would say I'm dealing with big data as a developer. Okay, cool. Um, well, we have enormous data and we continuously read articles on highscalability.com. Does that everybody read articles on highscalability.com? No, you should. Well, actually, you definitely should, but the problem there is that it's just a, you know, sort of compressed information, and you need much more than that that I will mention today. Um, but anyway, I read it, so come on. So this guy says, big data is easy. It's like normal data, but maybe a little bit bigger. <laughs> so let's discuss the size of the data. Um, what is this noise? Is it me? I think I did eat something, but <laughs> it's not that bad. Okay, no problem. Um, so is this big? How, what would you say? This is the smallest fish in the world, as far as, uh, as I could ask Wikipedia. Um, is it big? But this one is, right? It's like, it's massive. I can, you know, I can compare it. I can compare the size, whatever it means. So let me define big data just to be sure that it's big enough. It's petabytes of data every hour on different continents with complex relations and with the need to analyze them in almost real time for anomalies and to visualize them for your management. You can call this big data. Do we agree on this? Well, it's, I, I learned today this is CERN, right? <laughs> Any, anyway. Uh, yes, everything below this is Mickey Mouse data. Um, so good news is that you can intentionally grow. This data can become bigger and bigger and bigger. It just depends on your use case. Maybe technology or the common sense. But let's the other guy do his play his role. No problem, dude. Data is data. It's just the same principles. So is it really the same principles when you deal with huge amounts of data? Wherever they come, wherever they come from. So let's consider storage first, okay? Hey, no problem, dude. Storage is just a database. Does, it, does everybody agree on that? Well, I would adopt it because the storage capacity of one single box is limited. We all know this. And the common sense also knows this. So it doesn't matter how big you will grow your machinery. Somewhere is the limit. And it's 
typically physics. No problem, dude. For sure you're talking about SQL. It's old grandpa stuff. It doesn't scale at all. It doesn't count anymore. We have this new shiny world. So, okay. Let's answer this one. When you expect this big data, I've even learned this pronunciation, this big data, because it's big data, but this big data just sounds cooler. Um, when you expect big data, you need to scale very far. And that's built on distribution, and combined theoretically unlimited amount of machines, yada, 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 on single distributed storage. There is no way around this, except you invent something like a like black hole DB. Actually, there is, uh, as far as I saw, there is a backend for MySQL called black hole. It's pretty nice. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> somebody already invented this. I don't really know what, what it means, and I didn't play with this, but anyway, the name is already, already um, well, kind of protected. No problem, dude. No SQL scales, and it's cool. That's the most important thing. This is the most important architectural factor these days, the coolness of, a, of something. Don't forget I'm sarcastic. So those NoSQL guys, they achieve these things through sharding. You know, it's like sharding hides this distribution stuff from me. I don't need to take care of all that. Hmm. So building upon distribution is, from my experience, is much harder than anything you've seen or done before. I mean, you, you just buy every possible problem that you can buy with parallelism, but you also have the network in there. And those of you who are actually dealing with networks and, and uh, things like that would maybe agree that every single inch of a wire makes the whole thing unreliable, more unreliable than anything else. So the best thing is that you would just run the whole thing on the piece of sand and that, that's it. But even that can crash and become slow. Anyway, it's the hardest thing that you could ever do, except you fed a crowd with seven breads and walked upon the water. Everybody Christian here? Or at least has heard about this religion? It doesn't matter. It's not a religious discussion here. No problem, dude. I just have this cap, you know? Does everybody know here what cap theorem is? Do you really know in detail what cap theorem is? Well, actually, I don't, so... Uh, I think nobody knows in depth what cap theorem really means. So it's a lot of discussion around this uh, term. Um, Steve has um, had a great presentation on that, explaining React and uh, there are new terms. Well, actually, it's not that clear. But anyway, you, hey, no problem, dude. I will just pick two of three. That's so simple. It's absolutely easy, right? Well, the only thing that is absolutely certain about distributed systems is that some parts of it would just one day fail. And you will absolutely have no idea what happens there. That's absolutely certain. That's a given. You can try to protect yourself against this through monitoring and through people who are bringing up systems and stuff. But anyway, the P in this cap, when you deal with distributed system systems and when you start distributing, you have the pain to, to throw your data on several machines, on many machines. So P is a given. Your system has to be partition tolerant or it will just suck. So you will play with C versus A, you know, consistency versus availability, just moving the slider around. It's not the black or white, it just depends on the use case. Even if you would use one of the available uh, awesome data stores who are implementing, uh, well, a sort of dynamo paper, like Cassandra or React, it's, it's not always just black or white. You will not say that for every use case in your application you will do this. 
it's always consistent or it's always available. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. For this one part, it's sufficient to be inconsistent, but for this one, not. No problem, dude. This sharding, this works just seamlessly. And I don't need to take care of anything. Well, let me dub this one again. Because, for example, it's one of the hardest challenges when you start distributing, sharding, however you call it, that when you need to search in the data, to traverse through data, when you have like graphs, for example, this is one of the hardest problems to distribute a graph because traversals are not simple. I mean, you need to keep your data together somewhere. And it's also valid for any other thing because you will, in, in any system, you will hit one node, for example, and if this node doesn't have the data, it needs to know fast where the data is. So you have like, it's not big O1 that you use to jump to, the, uh, uh, to that you have to uh, access your data, but actually you will go to the next hop and it's absolutely necessary to know where it is in the whole system. So there is another hard challenge in this, in this whole sharding stuff and, and I mean, just going a, a little bit deeper than marketing slides. This is called naive hashing. Does anybody know what naive hashing is? Naive hashing would be when, when you have 10 machines and for hashing in order to know where the data is, you would build like a hash function. Typically this function with naive hashing would depend on the, on the number of machines. So whenever you change the number of machines and the most positive way to change the number of machines is to add one, the most stupid one is just to lose one without you knowing that it's gone. But anyway, uh, you would have to change your hash function because when you, when you, go, when you use modular, for example, so it's uh, just complete, completely different function there. And thus, you would have to rehash almost the whole thing. You just move the data around because next time when somebody accesses this data through the new function, it will not find it there. You need to hop further and further and further. So you need to rehash. So the opposite of this is consistent hashing. Anyway, the trade-off between data locality, and data locality is absolutely important thing in dealing with distribution. When you process data, you need to be as close to the data as possible. Consistency, availability, it's, uh, it's much more than just CAP. It's like, you know, read, write, search, speed, and latencies everywhere, and so on and so forth. So it's a real hard trade-off. You need to consider it. As a big data developer, whoever it might be, you need to take this into consideration. Hey, no problem, dude. No SQL? I mean, I'm really sarcastic, right? I wouldn't use this um, term for to describe a technology because it's just movement, you know. But anyway, no SQL will write asynchronously. And do map reduce, that's the magic word. It would do map produce to find data. Well, asynchronous systems RPC, well, at least it's necessary to create a system which is distributed where parts of the system communicate with each other in an asynchronous way through message passing, for example. That's the best example. So th there are even books that are not even taking anything else in account but a synchronous system. So the problem there is that with this asynchronous stuff is that it leads to the consideration of, of eventual consistency. Does everybody know here different sorts of eventual consistency, like read your own rights and so on and so forth? I mean, I wouldn't elaborate on this one. We can discuss it afterwards if you like. But anyway, there are different use cases, and it's again use cases where you don't want to have eventual consistency, you just want to have complete consistency. However you call this thing, when you try to transfer an amount of data from A to B, well, 
uh, you don't want to run into a situation where you have two accounts having same transferred data or transferred amount. No problem, dude. Of course, I don't have money to transfer. I'm just like starting a new startup. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I need to store lots of data. And I can throw any amount of data onto a NoSQL and it will deal with it automatically. It will just work. Did you ever experience somebody who thinks like that? Like pick product A and throw this data into it and it will do. Well, actually I did. So maybe it's not completely free from my own experiences here. Um, well, would you want to throw your data, which is maybe the most important thing, the most important asset of your company somewhere and just hope that it works? What happens if you just miss the target? So, concerning the storage, Data locality, redundancy, consistent hashing for a distributed system in order to find data very fast. Even with additional hops, if those nodes are not available, it's still close to big or one efficiency. Eventual consistency as a concept, combined with use case driven storage, concept or storage design. Those are key principles in succeeding with huge data, with storing huge data amounts. That's what I would call big data development. Does everybody agree on that? Let's go on. When you have data, data, when you have data, you need to bring this data maybe to your customers in whatever, well, presentation form. So it might be a web application or something or just a an API, whatever. So let's discuss this. Hey, no problem, dude. It's always, and I really experience people saying that, it's always the database being the bottleneck in the whole chain, somewhere behind the scenes. So it doesn't matter how fast are you are, you are up front. It's not my web service. So well, When you have thousand, mil thousands, millions, however, parallel requests per second begging for data, the first mile, that's mean, that means from your customer to the first uh, part of the whole chain, this will quickly become the bottleneck because, I mean, what will happen there is stuff will just get queued, discarded, all the packets, you will lose them. You, you, you can even monitor this, but how much does monitoring help you if you lose customers up front? When you expect people to use your platform, whatever it is, in a way that they, they don't see the difference between the peak time and normal time, this will quickly become your bottleneck. Just forget a database. Hey, no problem, dude. I'll get my, my, myself some real sexy hardware. Yeah, I bet you will. That's my answer. I need to play these two roles. It's a little bit difficult. But well, under the high load, when load is real high, the problem that, that the limits that you will hit are physics again. I mean, the whole thing somewhere in parts or everywhere will start to crack. So what will happen is you will just burn your hard disks, your boards will melt, your cards, whatever, all the wires. And you will heat up to maximum and, and heating is a real big problem still. I mean, not every company is able to go to Sweden or whatever Google went to and, and you know, to have an own iceberg um, just for the next couple of years. Anyway, 
it's not about this sexy hardware, whatever sexy hardware means, but I really know people who are saying, hey, sexy hardware. Uh, well, it's at least uh, not the term that I would use. But anyway, um, it's just about being able to replace this pieces of this hardware, having different paths through the system. So you distribute the whole thing once again. You just grow in a horizontal way, kind of with redundancies and with concepts that would allow you to lose part of the system and to bring up new, par uh, to bring up new parts of the system, however big it might be. Even while your system is running, that's the very important thing. What can happen to you with things like naive hashing is, for example, when you completely depend on this in a naive way, on the, on the amount of, on the number of your nodes in, in a system, you would have to bring everything down, turn on the new node, bring everything, everything up and wait for the complete rehashing or, when, or for caches getting warm and stuff like that. Anyway, when you want to keep this first mile scalable, you might have to pay more money for that. This infrastructure becomes more and more expensive. And, well, the problem is then that you wouldn't want to have it automatically. You shouldn't just accept a vendor saying you, hey, you bring up a new machine here, well, you will win like 5% more performance here, whatever performance is. Performance is a very difficult term. It has different facets. But anyway, you will, with this machine, which is like 10 millions a year, you will have 5% more throughput here. You will rather try to press out the maximum of your machines that you have, of the networks that you have, and look for technologies, how you can do this. Um, a um, Mr. Derek Ennis says, again, greeting to Derek Ennis to read you, he says, you need to saturate your network. So, um, yeah, that's the term. Okay, let's go on. Um, no problem, dude. I will probably write on my own, of course, or get myself a sexy C10K server. Does everybody know what C10K is? C10K is a is short for something that is able to do uh, more than 10,000 connections per second. So Apache HTTP daemon has limitations. There are benchmarks proving this. So it's like with 4,000 or something around this, when you use uh, this web server, you will start. Uh, uh, you will stop performing the expected way, and there are servers that go much further than that. Just think of nginx or something like that. So, the other thing is that I've promised that I will not bash or rant about any project, uh, any product here. Anyway, you can build. There is a technology that you can use to build something like that. And of course, the first thing that a big data, de big data developer should do is build all stuff on your own. Well, maybe you will get this one or write your own one. But it won't help you when your users are distributed all over the world. The problem is that the distance between them and your first machine, whatever it is, if it's load balance or something, is just too big. Geographically, it's still too far away. So if you have this massive load up front, you would have to go for something like CDN. Does everybody know about CDNs? Content delivery networks, Akamai? Well, at the peak times of, uh, well, at peak times where web or internet is being accessed, they drive like maybe 60 to 70% of the whole traffic there. They have real 
interesting algorithms on optimizing routing and, and things like that. So you, what you would do, you would use their infrastructure. You cannot pay for this infrastructure, uh, infra infrastructure because they are already in maybe a thousand data centers all over the world. They are always closer to your customer than you. They are doing DNS tricks that would like, trick your customer to a different server. So it's still www.youraawesomestartup.com. So you just want to push this load out of yourself, just away to somebody else. When you have this pain, you will have to pay for this because it's not that inexpensive. Hey, no problem, dude. Then I will push my whole platform out to the cloud. Who actually does cloud computing in this room? I mean, you are an expert in this, yeah, of course. Okay. So you're like providers, right? No, just users. Provider. Would you suggest somebody something like this? Sure. <laughs> sure you will. <laughs> well, it's more flexible and scales like hell, of course. Sure. You will see the scalability um, actually in the bill coming every month. <laughs> but anyway, um, well, what happens in these cloud setups when you go for them? It's still a difficult problem. For example, with EC2, with EC2 and the whole infrastructure, the problem there is that basically you cannot predict reliably how close your software, piece of software that will process the data will actually be to the data it processes. So for you, it's just completely transparent, but it needs to be as close to the data as possible so you can process it fast. If you start moving stuff around, it will just cost you time. And whenever, in some different cases, whenever virtual machines just get moved, you, you can see it in your private clouds, however you call it, in your data centers. It just, the world stops for a while. Just for a little. But think of gazillions of parallel requests coming th per second. Of course you can force data locality in cloud setups when you just pay more. It's a sort of agreement. Of course you can rent it. No problem with that. Anyway, you need to have the pain. You need to have the money for that. Data locality, geographic speciality. It's very important in provisioning data. Dedicated virtualization in context pre-computability, content pre-computability, what would it mean? You can use CDNs to host your data or host whole applications or host pages that are being pre-computed by you. So you don't hit the database, you don't get to the last mile, you just present some sort of inconsistent data for a moment or for 15 minutes or something. That's a way to do this if you have this geographic problem. And again, it's use case driven cloudification. You need to have the right use case for the right cloud based strategy. And it's not, again, it's not black or white. Those are key principles when you're a big data developer. So let's talk about processing of data. Hey, no problem, dude. It's just easy. That's classic MapReduce, right? You would process everything with MapReduce, even your own grandmother. Well, I do almost agree. The problem here is that... Does everybody know this MapReduce pictures and stuff? Yeah, so you have different phases, like, like Map and Reduce, right? So the hardest phase in those two, map and reduce, is called split. It would really suck if it would be called split map reduce. It's not a cool name. But the problem that you have, you have two huge piles of data. When you, it, it just depends on the product that you pick, but anyway, either it's a file system or a virtual file system or something, you would need to bring your data to this data store. And if you try to move around terabyte of data, 
You just count minutes, hours, whatever. Depends on the infrastructure. No problem, dude. So I will just, this could be a solution, I would just write straight to the data store of this MapReduce framework. It will just be fast like hell afterwards. It can be, this would be my answer, but, there is still a but. What if in your map phase you need to search the data and you still have to think of data locality? So when you want to search data, you would probably go for an index or something. That's what everybody does. Of course, no problem, dude. I would just take a cool indexing search, library engine, whatever. It will find my data in a snap. Let's ask the question. Would it really do this? You just need to imagine. You have a pile of data where well, a big chaos in there. And it's distributed over nodes that you have no idea about this, about where the data actually is, which data. You can ask for that. When you start indexing this, you go through the process that the pieces of index would have to be on same machines. Because it wouldn't make much sense to have index here and here a huge pile of data. When you map reduce and search during a map phase, for example, whatever phase in your whole pipeline there, you would love to find the data where the process of this data is actually running on. Either through hash-based key or key-based uh, uh, value uh, access or just searching for data. The, uh, the availability and unavailability of pieces of your system is, a, is another problem with that. So, data and index locality, both together, if you have this use case, combined with filling this data store of this framework directly or preparing your data for it in a form that it can consume it locally, data locally, uh, on different machines, as well as the use case driven technology usage. Use case driven technology usage. Don't throw one tool on everything. That's the message here. If you want it to work, you don't want to do this. That's, those are the factors that you need to take into consideration when you want to be a big data developer or just to get a little bit better, better through learning. So how about analytics? Does anybody here do analytics? Statistics, machine learning, yada, yada, yada. Cool stuff, I love it, really. Hey, but this guy just says, hey, the MapReduce framework will do this. Kind of magically, automatically. It's just, I mean, just take it and it does it. It does analytics. So I can just put my data into this thing, and afterwards I can do analytics. So are you really sure that there aren't two different basic use cases? Analyzing, fly, uh, analyzing data, which actually is flying in, near real time, and doing batch analytics afterwards. Just consider the time factor and it sounds a little bit different, right? So do you really think that this are both use cases for a MapReduce framework? I would just skip this one. Actually, as it was in Amsterdam, it was like the favorite slide here. <laughs> those guys. Anyway, you don't want to believe in MapReduce in for both use cases, really. And again, back to this time thinking, real time means time. It really means time. There are two basic sorts of real time. It's either hard real time or soft real time, so it just depends on what you do in the case of a problem. How would you manage this? But anyway, it's time, it's fixed. 
So it doesn't mean that it's as, as fast as possible or while you, while you can get a coffee or something. Or your user is still waiting for that. It's acceptable that he's getting the request, uh, the response in five minutes and it's still real time. No, it's not. But anyway, you can call it near real time. The problem here is that when you consider the fixed time in a distributed system, something like this will happen. You cannot predict time things in a distributed system, really. You will just die in a fire. Hey, no problem, dude. That's the typical answer. I love it. I'll get myself a sexy hardware. It will do everything. Sexy hardware does everything, of course. You don't need even your head, your brain, to, in order to install hardware. Just think of me being sarcastic, right? Not th that you just start throwing bad eggs at me. I'm sure that this guy will get himself some rocket fast hardware. So again, you cannot predict fixed, uh, and fixed time in MapReduce. It's impossible. You cannot ensure the completeness of data. That's the next problem. When pieces, when parts of your data are just have just gone, you cannot map reduce this data because it don't have it. Well, if you think of redundancy, maybe then yes, but still it's possible to lose the whole thing there. And causality is another problem when you try to to analyze for event causality, what happens after what. It's a real hard problem in a distributed system to, you know, to make an order of things that happen for analytics. Because, for example, time is unreliable in a distributed system and so on. So if you need to predict better while the data is flying in for causality and stuff, you would need to CP your data. Is this a term for you, CP? Complex event processing? Java development, uh, Java developers around? System like, systems like Asper? Okay, no problem. So what it actually does is uh, you have a sliding window going through, a, through an endless stream of things that happen. You can define this window to be like 10 minutes, and within this window you can analyze using a special language, which, which is different for every platform. But anyway, you can analyze how things happened depending on what. So it's the typical example is like when you, when you hear uh, church bells and, and you see a, a, a woman in a white dress and, and rice is flying around, so it, it's pretty sure that this is a marriage. You know, so this causality chain here. That's for that, and you can do this in real time. Well, in near real time. Again, real time things are real hard. So the most important thing in this whole tool, Zoom, is that as of now, your typical BI tool that you would use maybe is completely unaware of NoSQL stores existing around. That's one big problem, really, because they would expect, like, you know, using JDBC, ODBC, accessing this data store, and it's just a subset of data that you can get out, or at least a subset of this uh, protocol, how you can access the data, because they uh, don't implement everything. Okay, depends on the solution. No problem, dude. My MapReduce tool can completely hide this from me. I can just concentrate on doing stuff. Okay? That's the killer argument. I just want to do this. Well, about mathematics, I would just say that it's not possible to call yourself a big data developer when t when you well when you don't work with mathematics statistics probability and machine learning and stuff like that because that's what it is for any analytical task you would do you would need a whole lot of mathematics so you need math statistics and stuff like anybody 
in this world needs an iPad or two or three. I know people who have three. I don't know why. Excuse me? They have no kids. <laughs> Especially this guy doesn't. Anyway, it's a sort of, uh, well, let's skip it. Uh, um, so the principle is separation of immediate and post-fact analytics and complex event processing of data streams as data flies by combined, oh my god, it's cut, okay, combined with use case driven technology usage, use case driven technology usage once again, and statistical knowledge are key principles here uh, in analytics of big data processing. That's big data development. So we forgot this visualization, visualization part. Hey, no problem, dude. I have no idea about it. <laughs> hey, me neither. I have no idea about it, really. I mean, it's a science on, it, on its own. But I, I know people who are real deep into it and, and you know, are creating different sorts of maps, how to present big data. I mean, you cannot do this with an Excel sheet anymore. It's, it's just too much data. You need to group it, kind of, you need to color it, sort of, and, and so on and so forth. So just seek for this, and you find very many of them. Hmm. So what's the message? <laughs> so, well, he says I'm a smart ass. Well, I'm sometimes a smart ass. Uh, I don't like to be a smart ass, but sometimes it's necessary to convince people. Anyway. Um, I would just suggest following for a big data development, uh, developer. Don't trust in half-packet blog posts. Half-packet means in this case that people who are writing them are real smart. But they wouldn't start with Adam and, Adam and Eve, you know. They have read all this. They have used almost everything in those. Does everybody here in this room have all these books? You should get yourself some, <laughs> really. Well, actually, if you want to do networking, you will not want to miss this one, at least. Uh, statistics and so on, there is a, there's plenty of literature on it. This is a great one, by the way, to understand how database systems work. And, of course, a Tannenbaum, for me, I if you're a big data developer or not, you should have this book, and this book should, be just, should, should look like crap completely used, you know. There is no electronic version of it as far as I remember, but anyway. Let's let's briefly talk about full stack. Do you know this term full stack developer? Okay. It's a very emerging uh, and it's it's getting popular and popular this term. So the full stack is all this. And when I speak of hardware here, I don't mean only your Intel-based system, but all your load balancers. And even if you want to go for real speed, you will go for GPUs and, and, and you will uh, do some FPGA on some chips and stuff. So actually, I cannot call myself a big data developer if I don't do all this. But well, I still learn. So maybe I'm just one step further to know what I miss. But it will take a lot of time to know all that here. <laughs> time is a big problem, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, anyway, mathematics, algorithms, hardware, storage, very important thing. Operating system. The, the biggest problem that I have with, with the Java world is not that the JVM is crap. The JVM is awesome. But many people just ignore the fact that it is there and are in the situations where they use Hibernate for not even lazy loading 65,000 objects into the memory. I mean, and fighting things with, with half-backed on written caches and stuff. You know, when you have on the operating system level, you have like three, four of them, depending on what system you're running. You just need to know about this 
and to trust into those guys who are implementing kernels and stuff, they will be always better than anybody else because they concentrate only on this. Uh, data stores, abstraction over storage, and tools, tool chains, that's very important, not one single tool. Different languages, very important. There are different languages, I mean, well, well I should hide this one. <laughs> no, 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 no problem about this. You can do with several different things, several different things, even. Um, no, but there are platforms and languages that better suit some use cases and you should go for them and look at them and just be curious about them, the existence of them, check them out and not just throw one single tool on everything and say, hey, come on, it will work. I can still tinker it afterwards, so it might work, kind of. Network distribution, there is a whole bunch of literature on that. It's a very complex, it's real, real, very complex area. And statistics, visualization and all that, so you need math, absolutely, like an iPad. And you also, when you're a big data developer, you need to know your point of pain. There are not many companies in the business area, I mean, like, let, let's just exclude CERN, it's uh, very special, or medical uh, institutes, they are also very special, doing uh, uh, dif uh, in, in different dimension, dimensions, doing uh, pictures and stuff, analyzing anom anomalies and, and all that just exclude this from the enterprise or business perspective of you or a point of view you have like Twitter, Facebook and Google they have all the problems of course they are the pioneers of all that so they have also the data they have also the, the whole pain here but maybe you are in your company and that's very important to understand maybe you just don't have this pain at all or just one of these pains maybe you just need to satisfy your customers uh, coming in and have millions of parallel connections. Well, the problem is it's boring when you don't have this because you cannot play with the technology, with the cool technology. Well, anyway, you need to turn on your brain. And this is the most important thing in your tool chain. Just accept if you don't have these problems. Just skip it. Maybe you should look for another company. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Well, you can see, well, <laughs> I mean, curiosity is a very important factor and the wish to learn. You need to combine a team, to have a team of people who maybe have different focuses, but you need this knowledge overall. At least you need to be aware of things and you need to know that you cannot know everything. So you need, I mean, you just throw anything somewhere and you think, okay, it will store. You should go one, two steps further just down to the ground, seeing how things work. Most of those data stores, for example, are open source solutions. Just study the code. Look at the code, what they do. I mean, code is readable. Even if it's written in Erlang, it's still readable. No kidding, Erlang is a cool language and it's simple. So maybe you should have a look at it. One of the German guys will have a look at it. I hope so. <laughs> but anyway, you need to... Actually, in order to do something like this, you will have to grow your, long, uh, your knowledge more and more. Maybe with, with several people. I don't really believe in the concept of somebody called data scientist, because I think that as far as, as it gets down to, to a developer, he also needs to be a data scientist, because I hate to implement uh, mathematical formulas that I don't understand. So I need to know what are, the, what are the principles. Maybe not that deep because it's all about tinkering data out of something, training your classifiers, what not. But anyway, I need to understand this. I don't want to use a library or an algorithm written by somebody else if I have to run this in production later. I was just wondering, now that you said this whole thing about data locality being extremely important for speed, right? Then if you have 
sufficiently distributed or also replications of your data, wouldn't it be smarter just to set the jobs out in a distributed way? If you have non regularly distributed uh, your data, then you should be able to send the jobs to the data and then they get the results back. Yes, you can. Actually, you can. But it's sort of similar because you would send out jobs to, to the machines holding the data. So where is the difference? I mean, if a, however you call it, MapReduce or whatnot, you will, you will wait for something delivering results, maybe pre-calculated, pre-computed. So that's basically the same concept. Thank you very much, guys.